You're watching Vancouver TV, where we show you what's happening in your city. We've got the latest movie reviews and access to your favorite celebs. From fashion to red carpets, live shows, and more, we cover it all, keeping you informed about your city and in the know about upcoming events. I know who I am. When we are finished with you, you'll no longer be yourself. Everything doesn't mean you know everything. Tell me. We've just been hacked. Could be worse than Snowden. Facial recognition got a hit. Jesus Christ, that's Jason Bourne. Why would he come back now? There's a demonstration in front of the Greek Parliament building. I think she'll use it as cover. They tracked you. We gotta move. He's seen things. He knows things. What if he's not coming for us? What if it's something else? I volunteered because of a lie. This is Jason Bourne. I need to talk. 32 kills. People are safer because of what you did. find any peace. Not till you admit to yourself who you really are. To win tickets to see this movie and other fun movie price packs, visit www.vancouvertelevision.ca. Hello everybody, I'm Ashley and this is Maria. We're reporting for Vancouver Television at the fourth annual Summer Craft Market downtown at the Jack Pool Plaza. We are so excited to be here today. There are more than 60 craft artist vendors from all over BC specializing in ceramics and jewelry and much more. Let's go check out the fun. I love it and she specializes in sterling silver jewelry. How are you doing today? Great. It's a really it's nice a, day. Yes, it's yeah. a sunny day at the craft market. We're so excited to be here. Tell us about your specialty jewelry you design. Well, I've been making my jewelry for about 15 years and I really specialize in making um, jewelry that's very unique for people to wear and that it's that it can be put together in different collections so people can find things that are really unique for them. And I specialize in sterling silver. And what's the process of sterling silver jewelry, if you can tell us, please? The way that I make my jewelry is I, uh, I start with an idea, and then I cut or carve a piece of um, wax, and then I cast it, and then I make a mold of it, and then so then I make repeats. So then I get, each one is hand det detailed made, and then I can set my own stones and size everything to detail. So really make it customized. So when a customer comes here, I like them to make get exactly the size that they want. Even if it's a half size difference, it makes a difference to them. So then I'll make it specially for the customer. It fits perfectly. Mm -hmm. And you've been here at the craft market since the beginning. What has your experience been like? I love this market, especially this space. Mm -hmm. It's nice to be able to have a place outside yeah. so the customers can just come freely and just walk through. And it feels like even local people feel like they're on holiday. So Joanna, tell us about the lockets you make. Well, I make lockets, um, started in 2007 and it didn't intend to be a locket series, but I just made them as a reaction to what was happening in the world. So it started with my earth locket, 
and it says one can make a difference. And then people really resonated with that, so they wanted something that would make them think about the difference that they could make in the world, since it has the image of the world. And then from then, I've just gone to make other lockets, depending on what's happening. So it's gone from the earth, the dream locket, where you can focus on your dreams, the promise locket, the starfish, where you can focus on your travels. And it's the nice thing about the lockets is they're very personalized, not only in the attention of the locket, but then the, when I make them, the people pick, get to pick the, sot, the number. So I have a numbered series of lockets, um, so I know where each locket has gone all over the world. So I've made over 280 lockets. Wow, yeah. that's incredible. I think the favorite part of being a craft artist is I really get to make things that make a difference to people's lives. I know it's only jewelry, but I find that people um, put together a really personalized collection and that it, it mean, makes a difference to them. So people will, instead of buying like several pairs of earrings, they'll buy one or two pairs of earrings that really made, mean something to them. And I like working with the galleries. I've, got, I've sold over 200 galleries all over North America. So to get to know the gallery owners, and to me, the first sale is nice, but the second sale is when we're working together. So it's, it's nice to be part of the community. And, and the support in this community is amazing, from the Craft Council to the Vancouver Art Gallery, who's been carrying my work for years. It's just a really nice thing to be doing. Now, I see here that your jewelry is just as unique as your displays. Tell me about them. Oh, thank you. Well, I feel that handmade things should be displayed on handmade displays. So this, these displays started with, um, my friend asked me what kind of display I would like to have. And I said, well, I want to feel like I'm standing at a cocktail party. <laughs> so I, I, he made these displays for me and little tables. Um, and they can be packed away in, a, in two suitcases. So I can go to a, out of town with all my displays. And then I wanted them at eye level. So the customer doesn't lean down. So that we're at kind of equal, at an equal space when we're looking at the jewelry. And also I wanted to be interactive so that see, they all move around. Everything on my display is from the ball, these, they move around. So the customer has a choice on how they get to look at the pieces. And the rings are finished just as much inside as on the outside. So I wanted them to be able to pick them up off the ball or on the displays and try them on and see how they felt on their hand. That's awesome. And tell me what this is made out of the material. This is felting. So it's like needle felted. And so it's just like, it's nice to work with something soft after I've been working with the metal all day long. It's just with the, just like picking with, with the um, needle, just poke away at it. And these have structure inside. Um, I never know what the new displays are going to be. They always kind of pop out when I'm always fun. these together. Yeah. Hi everybody, I'm here with Olympia and she's going to be telling us about her handmade silver and gold jewelry. So you want to tell Hello. us a little about your stuff? Thank you. Um, well, I basically uh, have been doing this for about nine years and I have turned a hobby into a little bit of a trade, like a craft, and I'm really loving it. First year at the market? Yes, it is. It's my first time here. I've been part of Craft Council of British Columbia for just about a year, and I'm also on Granville Island on the, in Craft House. They support me, and I basically make my own stuff right from scratch. I melt down coins and turn them into ingots and hammer them all out and awesome. turn them into these pieces. I love it. Really like to focus on the customization of each piece. Yeah? Yes, I do. Um, and that's how I usually got started was I got basically customers that just wanted handmade pieces and they were very personalized. And then I thought I'm going to do a few shows and see what actually is good sellers and best sellers. And and the rest is from there, but usually I focus on custom pieces. Okay, do you want to tell us a little bit where the inspiration comes for your lovely jewelry? Well, it's funny you ask, that's a good question, because I'll tell you a little story about uh, a piece that I'm wearing right now. Perfect. I call it my Bruno balls. Okay, three dogs, Bella, Bruno, and Bear Bear. Bruno's nine, and about five years ago, we had to fix him, and I was mortified. <laughs> so tribute to him, I made this bangle. <laughs> And it resembles, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so there's Safe one inspiration. <laughs> and this year's the first year that I actually have them on the table for sales. So there you go. There's one inspiration. <laughs> so safe to say that each piece is very customized. I know, right? <laughs> I told you. <laughs> that is awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to tell us about your pieces. And I'd okay. love to have a little bit of a better look at what you have to offer. Absolutely. Thank you so much, thank Ashley. You. And the crew. We're here with Adia of Bellywood. How are you doing today? I'm great. Yeah, it's such a sunny day. It's a wonderful day at the craft market. I heard it's your first year. How are you enjoying it so far? 
It's been awesome. It's a really well organized event and it's full of like incredible Vancouver artists and some from like outside of Vancouver too. So that's been awesome to see what everybody else is up to as well. Definitely. So tell us about uh, Billy Wood and all the incredible wooden jewelry you create. Um, Billywood Designs. I've been doing it for about nine years, so long enough to kind of get the hang of it a bit. So um, I use all recycled and reclaimed hardwoods. So um, any of the colored pieces are made from recycled skateboards. So being in Vancouver, we have like a lot, we have of, a lot of those. Is totally, yeah. So yeah. I get a lot of board, broken boards and stuff like that from other skateboarders and different skate shops and stuff. And they're made out of seven ply maple. So it's a really awesome hardwood to reuse. And normally, like, unless you're doing some kind of art project or something, they would get hucked into the garbage because there's not a lot you can do after it's broken. So um, the jewelry and the belt buckles and stuff like that's a nice way to reuse it. And it's obviously going to last forever too because it's a super tough material. So, and then any of the rest of the jewelry I make with. Um, Offcuts from other woodworkers, mostly Vancouver woodworkers, so a lot of it's exotic hardwoods. So. Yay, local support. <laughs> exactly, totally. So the cycle continues, and then um, basically it's too small for them to use anymore. So if they're guitar makers or um, furniture or something like that, it's tiny bits that would normally like kind of get burned or thrown out. Yeah, exactly. And make the perfect like, earring size or even necklaces as well. Totally, yeah. So basically, after I'm done with it, it's usually just sawdust is all the, the only waste left. So it works pretty good. And then, um, yeah, and then the metal is just sterling silver or gold fill. So. so how important do you think it is to support uh, local craft artists and jewelry makers? Uh, I think it's incredibly important. And primarily because it affects me personally but um, also I think because that's your community those are your neighbors and your friends and you know and also I mean we're gonna support our community afterwards as well like it's kind of like I said before about the cycle like you know the money you spend on a local artist usually it gets put back exactly yeah it's staying in your community and also you're promoting usually like local stores and you know who are employing local people so you know it affects a lot bigger of a circle than just just the one artist or something and and a lot of times too they're employing their family members or different people as well like even if it's just for a show or something that they're getting somebody to come in and help so yeah I definitely think it's important yeah so I have something in my hand and it says reclaimed skateboard what is this exactly uh, it's a recycled skateboard so I make the belt buckles out of old skateboards, of course, so it's the artwork and graphics underneath the board after it gets all scratched up, and then the back side's where the grip tape was, and then I was left with all these long strips of leftover board, and because I can't throw anything away, I had all these giant bins, and then um, just started making the beer bottle openers. Wow, what a good idea! Yeah, so it's super fun, especially in the summertime, or if you have like a gift for somebody and you want to pair it with like a six-pack of craft beer or something like that, it yeah. makes a good little housewarming, so yeah. They're really fun to do and each one's different because it's from a skateboard too. So I um, mean got some like scrapes and stuff like that and the original artwork, so it works out pretty good. Yeah, very cool. Hello, we're here with Joanna. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Good. She's gonna tell us about all about her handmade bags here. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your booth? Sure, we make one of a kind handmade bags from recycled clothes. Oh wow, they're beautiful. Thank you. Awesome. And then leather bags as well? The bags have a mix of leather and other clothing textiles on them. It's supposed to simulate an outfit that you used to have that we redesigned into a bag. Oh, that's great. So that's where you get a lot of your inspiration from then? Uh, usually the, arc, the original architecture of the garment inspires me on how to use it, how to show it off in a unique way, how to accomplish a one-of-a-kind look on each bag. That's great, they're beautiful. Thank you. Uh, is this your first time at the market? This is actually my fourth year here in BC at the summer market. Oh wow, that's great. And how have you liked the support from all the local community in that so far this year? It's been pretty wonderful. Um, sometimes people will even come into my booth and comment that they've seen other recycled bags, but they've never seen anything done at this level. And I think that's a real compliment because it acknowledges uh, the detail, the amount of time we put into each piece. Every seam that we make, we press and pound out on a granite stone. And I think those things uh, become appreciated by a client who's seen recycled work before and then sees our work. Definitely, they are beautiful, that's great. So there is something so incredibly unique and lovely about your bags. Can you please tell us about that? 
Uh, there's three of us that volunteer together at Mind Recreations and we use the proceeds of the bags to put on the women's side uh, young women through post-secondary education, university or college and on the men's side we have a young man by the name of Yusuf that's in uh, elementary school in Tanzania and we use the proceeds from those bags to educate him. And at present we're on our eighth woman in ten years through university. Our current student is named Lisa She's an Ojibwe woman from the Kenora area and she's attending the University of Winnipeg at present. Oh wow, that is so incredibly lovely. I cannot believe that. That's oh, great. Thank you. That's so awesome. So the local support for coming out to these craft markets and all that is not only beneficial to you, but it's beneficial to people all across the world. Um, well, continental Africa and now at home here in Canada, so yes. Thank you for joining us for our afternoon down at the Summer Craft Market. We hope you really enjoyed. We're Maria and Ashley for Vancouver Television and see you next week. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. You are watching Vancouver Television and I am your host Christine White and your reigning Miss Vancouver 2015 and 2016. Today we're going to visit Lisa of The Cutting Room and she is from New York with a whole bunch of experience that she has brought here to Vancouver. So let's go check it out. Hi everyone, I'm here with Lisa, the owner of The Cutting Room. How are you, Lisa? Well, thank you. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So, Lisa, can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you, inspired you to do what you do? Well, um, I, was, I started out here in Vancouver uh, 25 years ago, and I started with a studio which um, quickly turned into a factory, and that was back in the early 90s. So. By 93, we had about 40 or I had about 40 sewers and we were manufacturing 10,000 units a month domestically. And um, I sold my first factory and then took a year off and started a second one, which we grew into, again, like about 40 people and manufacturing at that point 10 to 15,000 units a month. And we were doing US-based clients manufacturing domestic in Vancouver. So that was the 90s to the early 2000s. And then... Um, when I, when I sold my second business, I moved to New York, and I started helping young designers launch their brands. Every, any, everything from production right through to sales and marketing strategy, all of that. And after 12 years in New York, um, I put together a two-day seminar, which I produced in New York and LA, and I, I really enjoyed the teaching aspect while I was consulting. So when I moved back to Vancouver last year, I knew I was going to do something in fashion, but I didn't quite know what it was going to be. And there is a need in this city. It's, it's grown so much in, like, the fashion industry has grown so much and what Lululemon's done, what Aritzia's done, what Arcteryx has done. I mean, it's, you know, innovation really comes out of the West Coast when it comes to the apparel industry. And it's, it's fantastic what's happened over the 12 years that I was away. Um, I found that there was a need for a sample making shop, so where we work with brands. On that side of our company, um, we work with brands to make patterns. We do their samples, we do marking, grading, um, and we also do small production. So quick turn, small production, and then on this side of the shop, we teach. So we have fashion design, fashion illustration, sewing, um, Gerber, CAD, uh, Illustrator, Photoshop, we have some actually really great courses. So it's very eclectic. It's super eclectic, and when people are learning, they're learning, like our sewing class is taught by my head sewer, who's been sewing for 35 years, and she's sewed for some of the you know top brands people wear. So it's our beginner sewing class, like they knew nothing when they started, and they left with a men's shirt, for example, after eight weeks. So it's pretty, it's fantastic, and it's, it's the education part that I really love. That's awesome. You bring so much to the table, it's literally. <laughs> uh, so Lisa, could you tell us why Vancouver specifically needs a fashion school? Well, in 2017, we're planning on doing a full-time program, so a fashion design for full-time certificate program, fashion design and merchandising and media. Um, I think that it's not so much that Vancouver needs the school. I think that Vancouver and everywhere needs a much fresher way of teaching. And... I've found that in my career, 
when I've employed um, students that are just out of a four-year um, diploma program, they're fantastic and they know a lot of theory, but they have no, they really have no grasp on how to apply it and what to do. So the best way I can translate that, it's, it's sort of like if you imagine you've studied piano for four years and you know theory, but you can't play Happy Birthday. And I can relate because I'm a music teacher. Right. So exactly. <laughs> so, so you know what I mean. So, and the thing is, is that it's really, it's difficult because the schools are geared, schools are a business, as will mine be. I mean, it's, you know, it's, but schools are geared towards diplomas. And so you, you get a lot of fantastic education. And I think that our school is going to be um, very much geared towards students that have either taken a full-time program and want a more, want to sort of get to that next it would be almost like a like an MBA but in in the fashion entrepreneurship even though you know we're not giving MBAs <laughs> that's not exciting yet. that's exciting not yet <laughs> in the future for sure in the future you never know so and then we'll have boot camps so there'll be the year year long course year and a half long course but there'll be intermittent boot camps so if somebody wanted to um, basically go into pattern making for a career like get a job at Lulu or Arcteryx or any one of these fantastic companies they would come here for a 3 month long boot camp of becoming of being an excellent pattern maker. So what that really basically does is it takes, it lets somebody go from a diploma program and then you do this boot camp, and all of a sudden your earning capacity, you've increased 20 or 30 percent. So that's sort of more where I feel that there's a need is really taking this knowledge students have and making it apl applicable in the real world. Yes, and that's important. That's a, that's a really good take home to know. It is, and it's uh, it's um, you know, again, I think Vancouver needs it, but I think I think a lot of I think every major city sort of needs it. And um, teaching a skill set is different than teaching uh, academics or things that you you should learn. Um, so I think that people should learn stuff. Don't get me wrong. I think mm -hmm. diploma programs are amazing, um, but I think that there is now a need, especially with where the world's gone that people have skills and be able to use those skills and understand how to get from A to Z. It's interesting when you talk to young people, like they just, they want to be, they want to do this, but they don't have a concept of how to start it, where to start it, and then create it, and then grow it. So, the so, youth camps are really fun for that because it's really fun to take these kids. Right, and you had that recently. Yeah, we're doing our first youth camp for the summer is this week, and then we have our second youth camp is August 8th, so there's still spots for August 8th. It's one week, 10 to 4, and the kids, I mean, they're fantastic. They're amazing. But it's interesting, like over the 10 years, I work with kids when I was in New York too, and it's, you know, they their, their attention span is a little bit less, mm -hmm. so really just <laughs> keeping them focused on, okay, you've got two hours, and you've got to sort of complete this task, and it's... Ding, 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 ding. It's really adorable. So what did they design? Well, today, uh, today was day one. It's a very intense curriculum, but today they did their mood boards so that they can, um, it's very important that in design or in anything, you know what your uh, inspiration is, your muse is, what story you want to tell. So a mood board or an inspiration board really um, is the beginning of telling that story where the essence of your story is coming. So they started off with their mood boards and then from mood boards they went into illustration. So beginning to illustrate and understand fashion and concept and proportion, they illustrated some designs. And then after that they went into the first thing they made which is a cute makeup bag or pencil bag or lipstick bag, whatever they want to put in. But they also fabric painted so they, you know, they did inspirational sayings on it and then they sewed it together, which is their you know, entry-level zipper, so they learned how to put a zipper in. And then they started on their tote bag. So this was all in one day, they did. So everyone started, finished their zipper bag, and now they start on their tote bags. Tomorrow they'll finish their tote bags, and they start their dress, which is their final project. So they begin by laying that out, and then draping it on the mannequin, and seeing how fabric falls, putting it together, so for every four kids, we have an instructor, and we only have six kids um, in, our, in our fashion camp. So we've got one instructor, and then Quinn, my sewer, comes and helps them put it together. It's really fantastic. Yeah. So the kids design a dress. Yes. Wow. Well, I mean, we have the pattern, but they design it in the sense of they'll drape it, and then they add the different trims they want. They can change the hemline how they want. They might want to raise it. So we give them the base block, and then they get to... 
they get to change it from there. We make sure they finish it by Friday. I think it's really important that, you know, the biggest thing they're learning, aside from, yes, making a dress, is starting something and finishing it. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the mood boards that we're done today. Um, this is really great. I mean, they're all really great, but it's, it's super cool how you see their creativity come out and really kind of what it is they're, they're thinking or wanting to say or the style they like. And they start seeing, they sort of start seeing what it is they're liking. And so yeah. here you kind of understand a little bit of what their style is. They understand what their style is. Mm -hmm. Like this particular, this particular kid was, it's super, She's very architectural, the way she did her mood board. I've never seen one like this, you see? Like you can flip through it like a magazine. It's really interesting. And then these are some of the illustrations that the campers did today, which I think is so great for day one. They drew those. They, yeah, they sketched them. Wow. Those. And obviously colored them in with watercolor and gouache. It's beautiful and felt. So be this is the beginning more. of the inspiration or this the inspiration? The beginning. Okay. This is the beginning of the inspiration. Very cool. So here's one of the fun Ooh. and fancy things they get to make in fashion camp. I mean, it's quite a special tutu. Because uh-huh. you can actually wear this with a t-shirt if you're 12 and go out. Like, you know, like you can jazz this up. Super cool. Yeah. So this is something. You don't have to be 12, though. You don't have to be. I mean, I would wear this. It's sort of like what Carrie Bradshaw will remember. Okay. Yes. In Sex and the City. Like, it's, it's made to be right. worn, not, mm -hmm. you know. And this is what I was saying. It's their first zipper bag. This is great. One of our students made this today. Isn't that fantastic? And she put her name on the back. A true designer, which is fantastic. So you moved to New York, and what happened then? Uh, well, what happened then is um, I quickly got involved in consulting, which what really wasn't the main plan. Um, I moved to New York to get into film and producing film, which I did, a movie with Daryl Hannah in it. But uh, randomly, a woman overheard me speaking to a headhunter about my background and my experience in production and ended up hiring me to help her launch her active wear line. And from that, she, from there, I should say, a fabric wholesaler said, you should speak about manufacturing at such and such trade show, which I did in New York. And this was back in 2004. And manufacturing was still domestic manufacturing. People were really, you know, it was still, there's a fantastic mystery about it. So I would give one hour seminars on sourcing and how to manufacture and what things should cost. After having my factories here for 15 years, I knew you know, a lot about manufacturing. And so what came easy for me wasn't easy for others. And it was, it was wonderful to sort of bridge that and pass that along. And from that, I got a lot of clients that wanted help launching their line. Mm -hmm. So I started consulting for new and known brands and helping them from everything from development, putting them with the right pattern maker, working with them through the you know, three months it takes to develop a line.